this is our AP Chemistry Chapter 16 lesson video. This is part 5, and I'm going to cover section 19 point, uh, 19, 16.9 and 16.10. So don't get too excited and think equilibrium's over because there is still a whole other chapter. Chapter 17 is also equilibrium. Okay, but we're going to keep up with our whole acids and bases thing we got going on. We're going to take a little bit of a break from ice charts. There's going to be uh, some that pop up at the very end. But for the majority of this video, we're not going to do ice charts. So I'll give you a little bit of a break. All right, so next we're going to talk about acidic and basic properties of salt solutions. So a lot of times people just assume if something's not an acid or a base necessarily that it's neutral. So like a salt solution should be neutral. But that's not the case because the salt is going to break into ions and those ions could affect the pH. So nearly all salts are strong electrolytes, so they fully dissociate in solution. Hydrolysis is when a substance reacts with water to form H plus or OH minus. And of course, that's where you get the pH change. So in general, an anion, which of course is your X negative, the negative ion, in solution can be considered the conjugate base of an acid. And if the acid is strong, then the conjugate base will have no effect on the pH. Because remember, strong acids have negligible uh, conjugate bases. If the acid is weak, on the other hand, then the conjugate base is a weak base and will form hydroxide ions, which increase the pH, making it basic. So what happens is if you have the conjugate base of a weak acid, so for example, HF is a weak acid. So if you have F minus floating around, it's going to react with water to form HF and OH minus. And so that's where you get that higher than 7 pH. And so we would say, oh, okay, well that solution is going to be basic because the pH is increasing. Amphiprotic anions can act as an acid or a base. So for example, HSO3 negative. Is it going to lose a hydrogen? Is it going to gain a hydrogen? We don't know. So what you have to do is compare your Ka and Kb. If Ka is larger than Kb, it will end up forming an acidic solution. But if Kb is larger than Ka, it will end up forming a basic solution. So you would just need to know your Ka or Kb. And if you only know one of them, remember, we know that formula, Ka times Kb equals 1 times 10 to the negative 14. So we could calculate the other one if we needed to. Polyatomic cations, whose formulas contain one or more protons, can be considered the conjugate acids of weak bases. So, for example, NH4 positive is the conjugate acid of the weak base NH3. The weak acid will donate a proton to water to and form H3O plus, lowering the pH. So see, if we have the weak base NH3, it's going to make the conjugate acid NH4 positive. When that reacts with water, the NH4 positive will lose a hydrogen to water, making H3O plus, or H plus, which means it's going to be acidic because your pH is going to be less than 7 if you are creating H plus. There we go. Metal cations will react with water to lower the pH unless it's a metal cation from a strong base, which are the alkali metals, lithium down to cesium, and the heavy alkaline earth metals, which is calcium, strontium, and barium. The mechanism of metal cations is no longer part of the curriculum, so we don't have to go into why that makes it acidic. So if you see a metal cation that was not from a strong base, it's going to make the solution acidic. So, to summarize, an anion that is the conjugate base of a strong acid does not affect pH. So if it comes from a strong acid, it's not going to affect the pH. An anion that's a conjugate base of a weak acid will increase the pH. Okay, so if you have that conjugate base, it's going to make the solution basic. A cation that is a conjugate acid of a weak base will decrease the pH. Because of course an acid is going to decrease pH. On the other hand, a cation that is part of a strong base will not affect the pH. And then other metal ions will cause a decrease in pH. When a solution contains both the conjugate base of a weak acid and the conjugate base of a weak base, the ion with the largest K influences the pH. So 
So you just look as KA, KB, which one's larger. That's what's going to happen. All right, so let's look at the first one together. So it says determine whether aqueous solutions of each of the following salts will be acidic, basic, or neutral. Okay, so before we start this one, let's just list our strong acids and bases because you're going to need this for the whole time. All right, so there are seven strong acids. We have HCl, HBr, HI, we have HNO3, we have HClO3, HClO4, and H2SO4. Okay, so see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. All right, you have eight strong bases. So you start at lithium on the periodic table and you work your way down. So it's LiOH, NaOH, KOH. Like I'm just, if you look at a periodic table, I'm just working my way down. RBOH, CSOH. Then we switch over to group two, which is the alkaline earth metals. And we go from calcium to barium, but these have a positive two charge. So it's calcium with two hydroxides, strontium with two hydroxides, and barium with two hydroxides. And so you can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So what we're doing is we're looking for an anion from a strong acid or a cation from a strong base. The H's and the OH's aren't going to be listed. All right, so if it comes from strong, it doesn't affect the pH. If it comes from weak, that's when we got to figure out what's happening. All right, so I find barium. Barium, is that part of one of the strong bases? So I look, it is. It's a strong base, so I just exit out. It comes from a strong base, so it is not gonna affect the pH. So then I go to my anion, we have acetate right here. Acetate is not one of my strong acids. So that means it is the conjugate base of a weak acid. So if it is a conjugate base of a weak acid, that means the solution is going to be basic. Just like that. That's all we gotta do. Alright, so let's look at part B together. So NH4, does that come from a strong base? No, it doesn't. So this comes from a weak base, so it is the conjugate acid of a weak base. Right. And then I look at Cl. So Cl comes from a strong acid. So it does not affect it because it comes from a strong acid. So that means I have a conjugate acid floating around. So it's acidic. Just like that. All right. So our next one, CH3, NH3. Well, do I see that on my strong bases? No, I don't. So what that means is this is a conjugate acid of a weak base. Br comes from a strong acid, so it does not affect because it comes from a strong acid. So that means I have a conjugate acid floating around, so it is acidic, just like that. All right, K comes from a strong base, so it does not affect the pH. NO3 comes from a strong acid, so it also does not affect pH, so KNO3 would stay neutral. All right, Al is not from a strong base, okay, so we're just going to put metal ion. All right, ClO4 is from a strong acid, so it's not going to affect metal ions will make the solution acidic. Remember, metal ions, unless it's one of the metals from the strong bases, which it was not. All right, so let's let you try one. There we go. All right, so for yours, it says in each of the following, indicate which salt in each of the following pairs will form a more acidic or a less basic solution. Okay, so you're gonna like compare the two and pick one. That's what you're doing in each set. So here's our strong acids, strong bases list. So I'll give you a chance to pause it, try it, and now I'll assume you've done that, we'll look at it together. So Na 
comes from a strong base, so it is not going to affect the pH. NO3 comes from a strong acid, so it is also not going to affect the pH. So NaNO3 is going to be neutral. Okay, I'll just kind of circle right there because I'm going to run out of room real fast here. Fe is a metal ion that does not come from a strong base. NO3 does come from a strong acid, so it does not affect. Metal ions make solutions acidic. Okay, so I have a neutral solution and I have an acidic solution. It says who is more acidic? Well, obviously the acidic solution. So you should have gotten that one. All right, so let's look at part B. K comes from a strong base, so it does not affect the pH. Br comes from a strong acid, so it does not affect the pH. So neither of them affect it, so it is again neutral. K again comes from a strong base, so it does not affect. BrO does not come from a strong acid, it comes from a weak acid. So remember, it is the conjugate base of a weak acid. So if I have a conjugate base floating around, this one is going to be basic. All right, but it asks me who is more acidic. Now, between neutral and basic, the one that's more acidic would actually be the neutral one. Okay, you're not necessarily going to get an acidic one for all of these. All right, so let's look at part C. So C3 in, uh, sorry, CH3 and H3 is not from a strong base. So it is the conjugate acid of a weak base. Cl is from a strong acid, so it does not affect the pH. Okay, since I got a conjugate acid floating around here, this one is going to be acidic. Or BaCl2. Ba is from a strong base, so it does not affect the pH. Cl is from a strong acid, so it also does not affect pH. So this one would be neutral. So which one's more acidic? Well, obviously the one that says acidic. All right, the last one is probably the trickiest one. Technically, you really need to look up K values, but I'll show you how I did this one without looking up K values. All right, so we have NH4 that did not come from a strong base. So this is the conjugate acid of a weak base. And then NO2 does not come from a strong acid. So this is the conjugate base of a strong acid. So like I said, normally you would need to stop and look up K values, but we're not going to do that because I'm going to go ahead and look at my other one. NH4 still comes from weak, so I still have the conjugate acid of a weak base. NO3 does come from a strong acid, so it doesn't affect it. So see here I have a conjugate acid and base that are fighting each other. Here. I just have my conjugate acid, so this one is going to be more acidic because I don't have a conjugate base fighting it. All right, so hopefully you didn't find that too hard. I personally love those kinds, but obviously I love like all of the stuff that we're going over, so really I'm not a good indicator of whether or not something's fun, obviously. All right, so let's move on. So let's look at this one together. So it says predict whether the salt Na2HPO4 will form an acidic solution or a basic solution on dissolving in water. So it gave me the Ka. So remember, if we're not sure if something's amphiprotic, what we do is we compare the Ka and the Kb. They only gave me Ka, so how do I figure out Kb? Well, I used the formula we learned in the last video. So, ooh, my marker is being fantastic. Ka times Kb is 1 times 10 to the negative 14. So I'm going to solve for Kb. So it's 1 times 10 to the negative 14 divided by my Ka, which is 4.2 times 10 to the negative 13. And so for Kb, I got 0.024. Or you could say 2.4 times 10 to the negative 2. 
So then we just look. Who's bigger, Ka or Kb? Well, Ka is 10 to the negative 13. Kb is 10 to the negative 2. Since Kb is bigger, it's going to be basic. Okay. If Ka had been bigger, it would be acidic. That's super easy to remember. All right, so y'all try the next one. Okay, I'll assume you paused it, tried it, and we'll look at it together. So it says, predict whether the dipotassium salt of citric acid, which is this, will form an acidic or basic solution in water. And it gave me the Ka value. Okay, so again, I just need to calculate Kb. I'm not going to rearrange the formula again. You just saw me do that. We're not in basic algebra here. We're in AP Chem. All right, so I do my 1 times 10 to the negative 14 divided by my 4 times 10 to the negative 7. And for Kb, I ended up getting 2.5 times 10 to the negative 8. So then I just look at who's bigger. Well, Ka is 10 to the negative 7. Kb is 10 to the negative 8. Since Ka is bigger, it is acidic. So hopefully you got that one right. Just using a basic formula. Plug and chug, as one of my college professors used to say. All right, so last section, y'all. We are almost there. So next we're going to talk about the behavior of acids and bases based on their chemical structure. So factors affecting the strength of an acid include bond polarity. Okay, so we're looking at like the dipole moment that occurs between that acidic hydrogen and the rest of the molecule. The more polar the bond, the stronger the acid, which means it's more likely to break apart and produce that H+. As you move across a row on the periodic table, electronegativity increases, so acidity increases. So if I was like comparing S and Cl, HCl is stronger than H2S because Cl is more electronegative than, or, yeah, than S is. All right, another thing it depends on is bond strength. A stronger bond is less likely to break, and so it's less likely to release that H+. Bond strength decreases as you move down a group on the periodic table, so acid strength increases. Okay, so as we move down, bond strength decreases. That's why HF is a weak acid. Even though F is the most electronegative element on the periodic table, that HF bond is incredibly strong, and so it doesn't want to break um, to produce the H+. Remember, F is going to bond with somebody, and whoever it wants to bond with. We all know this. And then three, the stability of the conjugate base, which is your X minus. All right, those are the factors that can affect the strength of an acid. But another thing that we have to focus on is oxy acids, which are obviously acids that contain oxygen. So oxy acids are acids with an OH group and sometimes other oxygen atoms that are bonded to a central atom. So like H2SO4 looks like this. So you have these OH groups and we have some other oxygens that are bonded. So the generic formula is YOH. So there's something bonded to OH. That's a generic formula for an oxy acid. For oxy acids with the same number of OH groups, the acid with the most electronegative Y is more acidic. For oxy acids with the same Y, the acid with the most oxygens attached to Y is more acidic. That's why H2SO4 is a strong acid where H2SO3 is not. Because the more oxygens you have, because oxygens are very electronegative, the stronger the acid. Carboxylic acids contain a carboxyl group called COOH, and so it looks like this. It's C with a double bond to oxygen. I'm going to put our uh, valence electrons just so you remember they're there. And then a single bond to an oxygen and a single bond to a hydrogen. Okay. And so that's what, like if you ever see COOH, that is the format or the setup of it. All right, so let's knock out this sample integrative exercise. So as I told you, um, we are going to go back to ice charts, and I believe it's here. We do have one ice chart coming. Okay, so just letting you know. All right, so it says phosphorus acid, which is H3PO3, has the following Lewis structure. So here it is right here. Explain why H3PO3 is a diprotic and not a triprotic acid. So when you just look at this, it seems as though it should be triprotic. But when you see this structure, there's only two hydrogens that are bonded to that super electronegative oxygen. Remember, it needs to have a large electronegativity difference for that hydrogen to be able to be released once it's put into water. 
this hydrogen is bonded to the P, which is not as electronegative, so it is not going to be an acidic hydrogen that will be released. So I put only two of the H atoms are attached to the electronegative oxygen atoms. All right, and so that's how you can tell whether or not an H is likely to be an acidic H. All right, so part B, unfortunately, is not quite as easy. All right, so it says a 25 milliliter sample of a solution of H3PO3 is titrated with 0.102 molar NaOH. It requires 23.3 milliliters of NaOH to neutralize both acidic protons. What is the molarity of the H3PO3 solution? Okay, so y'all, you know how to do these. We know the molarity and the volume of the NaOH. So the first thing I need to do is figure out moles. All right, so we know that moles equals molarity times liters. So my molarity is 0.102. And I need to change this to liters, so it's 0 0.0233 liters. And so once I multiply that, I got 2.38 times 10 to the negative 3 moles. And that is of my NaOH. Alright, but the thing is, we know that it is diprotic, the uh, H3PO3. So in other words, one or two NaOHs are needed to neutralize one of those because this has two hydrogens. All right, so I can say, okay, so two moles of NaOH can react with one mole of H3PO3. I know that seems weird, but it's because we decided this was diprotic and not triprotic. If all three hydrogens could be removed, I would have to say three moles of NaOH will react with it. But it told us in part A it's only diprotic. So two OHs need to react with each of those. All right, so once I did that, I ended up getting uh, 1.19 times 10 to the negative three moles of H3PO3. But the thing y'all was, it didn't ask me how many moles, it asked me what's the molarity. Okay, so I have the moles, and I know how much I started with, 25 milliliters. So I just divide it by 0 0.025 liters, and I ended up getting 0 0.0476 molar. All right, and it looks like in part C, we're going to need this as our concentration, because we're about to do an ice chart. Surprise! Um, so we're going to need this number. So when you see me pull this number in a second, that's where I'm getting it from. All right, so hopefully that one wasn't too bad. We did questions like this all the way back in honors. The only thing that would have been different was I wouldn't have expected you to know that was diprotic. I would have just let you go with three. So I probably would have given you a different acid to begin with. All right. So it says the original solution from part B has a pH of 1.59. Calculate the percent ionization and the Ka1 for H3PO3. Okay, so we need our ice chart. So remember, we're just going to set up our basic acid reaction. So this is where I'm going to pull that previous number. Okay, so our concentration was 0 0.0476. That's what we got from the previous part of B. It didn't tell me I'm starting with any H plus or A minus, so I just put zero for that. But it did tell me what the pH is. So from pH, I can either get H plus or OH minus. In this case, H plus would be helpful. So I can say, okay, well my H plus is 10 to the negative 1.59. And so once I put that in, I got 0.026 molar. All right, so that means my H plus at equilibrium is 0.026. My A minus, because it's a one to one ratio, is also 0.026, which meant I had to add that much to get those equilibrium amounts. So that means from the reactant side, I had to subtract that much. So once I subtracted, I got 0.0216. Once I have my equilibrium amount, now I can solve for Ka. But I also need to do percent ionization. So let's not forget that. Let's go ahead and do that one. So remember, percent ionization is just your H plus at equilibrium over your HA initially times 100. So my H plus at equilibrium is 0.026 molar, and my HA initial was my 0.0476 molar times 100. 
So once I solve for that, I got 54.62%. Okay, but it asked me for two things. See, I'll always be careful of that. You know, it's just never ending. We can never give them enough information, right? So then I solve for K. So we know Ka is my products over my reactants. So it's 0 0.026 times 0 0.026 over my 0 0.0216. Alright, and once I solve for that K value, I got 0 0.031, just like that. And remember, no units for K. No units for K. Alright, so you just got to be careful of, you know, making sure you're solving for what they're asking for. And remember, K has no units, but concentration does. Okay, it's easy for when we deal with a lot of Ks, you kind of forget that concentration has molarity. Ah, oh, and the end. So like I said, y'all, don't get super excited. We still got a whole another chapter of equilibrium, chapter 17, where we're going to start focusing on titrations instead. Okay, so we'll still be sticking with the whole acid and bases concept, but now we're going to start combining them together instead of just, hey, what is the Ka for this acid? Or, hey, what's the pH of this solution? We're going to start mixing them together to do neutralization, and we'll start dealing with titration curves. So that's what we have coming up next.